Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, March 7th, 2014, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, Senator Cruz calls for abolishing the IRS. Then, a man is charged with wiretapping for filming police. And are you ready to tell the DHS about your sex life? That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I mean, he's a bully perv. You want to start a fight with me, punk? Huh? You punk? You think you can shove me around? We need to abolish the IRS. That was Ted Cruz at CPAC yesterday calling for the abolishment of the IRS. Now, this was just uh, something that was tossed around by libertarists in the past, but now I guess it's going mainstream thanks to the Republican Party there. But come on, we all know that the Republican Party would not know what to do with themselves if they weren't able to tax the American people to fund foreign wars and the defense budget, CIA, FBI, the war on drugs, you name it. I mean, they are, they're politicians after all. But calling for the abolishment of the IRS and the Federal Reserve, this isn't, this isn't that crazy. I mean, it's actually a very great idea. And in fact, a lot of people have been trying to figure out how to circumvent these corrupt agencies. One of those mechanisms was Bitcoin. And a lot of people thought that this could be a way to get past the corrupt bureaucracy there. But now Newsweek is reporting that the elusive founder and creator of Bitcoin may have been working on behalf of the government. Newsweek reports that the Bitcoin founder did classified work for the U.S. military. After Newsweek's Leah McGrath Goodman tracked down Satoshi Nakamoto down uh, at his humble house in L.A., she was apparently able to verify his role as the founder of Bitcoin when he said, I am no longer involved in that and I cannot discuss it. It's been turned over to other people. They are in charge of it now. I no longer have any connection. Now, later, he backpedaled when a bunch of other journalists descended upon his home and he said his statement was taken out of context and he wasn't involved with Bitcoin at all. But of course, this revelation isn't going to sit well with users of the cryptocurrency. McGrath asks, did he act alone or was he working for the government? Bitcoin has been linked to everything from the National Security Agency to the International Monetary Fund. Now, this revelation comes just days after another Bitcoin CEO was found dead in Singapore of an apparent suicide. So whatever the truth behind Nakamoto's history, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that he doesn't want to tie himself to Bitcoin, especially if he is working with the government. But his background working on classified projects for the military is only going to further the case for some people who believe that Bitcoin is just a Trojan horse for bringing in a one world currency and a cashless society. So that's definitely something to think about, especially as a lot of these Bitcoin exchanges disappear into thin air. Now, last year, we reported on the case of a Canadian woman who was stopped by the U.S. Uh, Customs and Border Protection Agency, they said that a systems check had found that she had um, had a mental episode in 2012 and that she would have to go undergo some a mental health check by a DHS approved doctor in order to enter the United States. Well, now we have another case of this happening. This time, Christine Vonderhaar, a senior lecturer at Indiana University, was confronted by DHS officials. They obtained copies of her emails and they began quizzing her about her sex life. Now, the pr professor was just traveling to the airport. She was helping a friend pick up some computer parts that had been shipped separately. Her friend, Greek national Demetrius Papathiodoropoulos, had already arrived in the country. He had a valid business visa, which allowed him to enter and leave the United States for a period of 10 years. Now, both Vonderhaar and Papa Theodoropoulos were detained by DHS officers, and they were bombarded with questions about their private lives, including whether they had shared sexual relations. The feds were alleging that the two secretly conspired so that he could stay in the country illegally. Now, the lawsuit states, given that Mr. Papa Theodoropoulos had retained his hard drive that contained these emails, the only way that the Customs and Border Protection agents could have reviewed them is if someone had surreptitiously monitored their communications and then reported those communications to these agents that were questioning her. And the lawsuit also states that 
the employees of the United States, it was admitted that employees of the United States had read email communications between them. Now, the Customs and Border Protection agent anyway seized Papa Theodoropoulos' passport, and they commenced proceedings to remove him from the country, claiming he had misrepresented his intentions. Now, first of all, need I point out the hypocrisy here? Here we have a man who was granted a visa to enter and exit the United States for 10 years, and now they're kicking him out of the country. Meanwhile, we are pushing to just open the borders to illegals, coaching them before they even get here, how they can milk the system, letting them know that once they're here, we'll protect them and there's all kinds of systems in place for them. What is happening here? But then the other big issue is that the DHS is now obtaining people's emails. We had already reported before about the TSA is doing these pre-screen checks and Googling people and finding out information so that when you get to the gate, they can ask you about it. But now they're actually getting into people's emails. I, I did a report yesterday that talked about fusion centers. You definitely want to check that out because we have a whole bunch of private businesses who are in collusion with these fusion centers. And you might be surprised to know what kind of information they are sharing. But hey, they want to remind you, they're the masters, we're the slaves. They can know whatever they want to know about you. And they will just ask George Thompson. He was reminded of who's the master and who's the slave when he was recording a police officer who was talking on the cell phone and just yelling loud expletives. And Mr. Thompson yelled across the street, hey, you know, keep it down. Why don't you stop using that uh, bad language? And the cop was like, why don't you shut the F up and mind your effing business? So after he said this, Thomas pulls out his cell phone and he begins recording it. The cop sees it and immediately stops what he's doing, runs across the street and insults the guy and then puts him in handcuffs. The police report claims that Thompson was attempting to film secretly. Thompson outright denies this claim, saying he had his arm completely outstretched as he filmed. And unfortunately, the cell phone footage was mysteriously deleted in police custody two days after the incident. Now, according to Massachusetts state law, it's a crime to audio record anyone without them knowing, but many consider that law null and void given the Supreme Court's decision to uphold the right to uh, film police in public. They have no expectation of privacy, just like everyone else, the general population, they shouldn't either. But first of all, it's not wiretapping to record police on your cell phone. Wiretapping is what Piers Morgan did when he tapped into the phones of people he was trying to do stories on through his tabloid newspaper, actually eavesdropping on their phone calls without their knowledge. That's wiretapping. So here they're just twisting the law. But secondly, no one is talking about how the police tampered with evidence. What about that? Tampering with the evidence. They make this guy spend the night in jail. They charge him with wiretapping and resisting arrest, of course. Um, you know, so if they're not going to get in trouble for that. They just do what they want. And remember, masters, slaves. This is how apparently things are working here in America, where the public servants have now turned into the public masters. Implementation of the laws arbitrarily. And the FAA tried this as well. They attempted to sue a photographer who had used a drone to film above a college campus at the University of Virginia. It, he is a photographer, and Raphael Perker is the only person that the FAA has tried to sue. The FAA sought to fine him under its regulation against operating an aircraft in a careless or reckless manner so as to endanger the life or property of another, which the agency argued applies to drones. But the fact is, there is no law that says model aircrafts can't fly. There just aren't any laws against commercial drone use. And a judge agreed with Perker and they dismissed the suit. So this is a significant decision because for the first time ever, we have guidance from a judge on whether that 2007 ban on commercial drone operation is legally enforceable. And apparently this judge is saying it's not. There are no laws governing that. So the FAA is now working on a proposal for drones weighing less than 55 pounds. That'll be out later in the year. This is great news for Amazon and the other companies who are hoping to bring drone delivery right to your doorstep at least for a few more months before the FAA drops their regulations, fly the drones. <laughs> now coming up, 
John Bown has an excellent in-depth look. He's going to expose the hidden racist past of the Democratic Party. It is quite eye-opening. They're so quick to call the Republicans out, but man, how quickly they forgot where they actually came from. You're not going to want to miss that. And then right after that, we are going to have the incredible five-week transformation of Shane Steiner. You're not going to want to miss this. My friends, Alex Jones here to tell you about some of the most important information concerning you and your family's health. Radiation levels have more than doubled in the last 60 years in the Northern Hemisphere from all of the nuclear testing and radiological accidents. Radioactive contamination is now in most of the food supply. There's only two ways to avoid this. Move south of the equator or properly protect your thyroid with nascent iodine. Looking to protect my family, I've done deep research. Nascent iodine is the purest, cleanest, absolute best form of of iodine to protect yourself and your family. It's made right here in the USA, completely non-GMO. I searched out the best quality and now have developed a double strength form of nascent iodine exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Nascent iodine is on record as one of the only safe ways to detox from fluoride poisoning. Survival Shield Nascent Iodine. Secure your super high quality nascent iodine today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. Many anthropologists and archaeologists believe that before man even discovered uh, the power to harness and use fire, we were involved in agrarian activities. That is, taking the seeds of plants and then replanting them to produce more. The very foundation of our modern civilization and human culture is centered around the planting and cultivation of edible plants. Here are some of the amazing deals at InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. The Survival Seed Vault by My Patriot Supply features only the finest survival heirloom seeds for a robust and hardy garden, even in the toughest times. We also have starter varieties of the deluxe seed packages for fruit, salad, salsa, peppers, medical herbs, and more. Go to the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. Alex Jones may sound crazy, but still has 300 million YouTube. Uh, uh, well, he had 300 million people that have watched him on YouTube. And that sort of fringe, arch conservative, uh, deeply, I think, racist strain is is being tapped into at, at, at crazy profit by people in the media. Well, it is. The Democrats have been on the offensive for far too long, deeming any who oppose their views as racist. But many people don't realize that it was the Republican Party that spearheaded the abolition movement, beginning with Democratic Republican Party member Thomas Jefferson. Yes, Jefferson was a slaveholder, but he included bold anti-slavery language in the original draft of the Declaration of Independence that was removed. As president on March 2nd, 1807, Jefferson signed the Act Prohibiting Importation of Slaves, this act took effect in 1808 and was the earliest allowed under the Constitution. In 1863, Republican President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed slaves held in the Confederate States. The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution took effect in December 1865 and finally ended slavery throughout the United States. That year, the Ku Klux Klan was founded. Historian Eric Foner observed that basically, the Klan was the military muscle behind the agenda of the Democratic Party, the plantation owner class, and all those truly afflicted with a mental disorder that is racism. The Klan's purposes were to reverse the interlocking changes sweeping over the South during Reconstruction, to destroy the Republican Party's infrastructure, undermine the Reconstruction state, Re-establish control of the black labor force.